on today's episode of Gathering the Kings. Let your ego aside a little bit. You know, we can always get better. And as long as you have that mindset, it changes everything. You are listening to Gathering the Kings with Chaz Wolf, featuring fellow seven, eight, and even nine figure business owners who have real battle scars from business and life, but have prevailed as the king that they are designed to be. We welcome high performing entrepreneurs to the stage in order to reveal the real of the real on what it takes to build a successful business today. We dissect the good and bad decisions they've made along the way that give a true and accurate picture of the journey of success and how you too can get there. Through this dialogue, you will learn the value of growing your network and surrounding yourself with power players and kings like today's guest. Grab your pen and notebook because we're about to dive in. What's up, everybody? I'm Chaz Wolf, your host, Gathering the Kings podcast. Today, I have a super unique guest. They're all unique, but today I got Landon Malave here on the King stage. My brother, how are you? I'm doing well, Chaz. How are you? Dude, I couldn't. I'm sure there's a ways I could be better, but I feel pretty darn good. I'm appreciative that you're here. This is unique because, dude, we know each other, man. And I've had a few friends here on the show. I've had some high performers, but we know each other through Gathering the Kings, specifically the Mastermind Group. And uh, so we'll get to talk about that here a little bit later. But dude, it is an absolute pleasure to, to not only know you, be friends with you, to run with you, but to have you here sharing with all the other entrepreneurs today. I want to just to plug that for the listener because they're going to get a ton of opportunity, of a mindset, and they should be inspired here today as well. Landon, I know you got a couple different businesses and you're in the process of scaling multiple at the same time. Tell me what kind of business that you're in. So we kind of started as a just full landscape construction company. Over time, it's manifested into this whole another realm, I guess you could say. Yeah. I was super fortunate in the fact that I learned how to build waterfalls from my mentor, who's 78 now, and he taught me the ropes. And right. it really took my business to a whole nother level that I really didn't know I was really capable of within that came some faux rock stuff that he did in zoos and stuff all over the world. But I already had the landscape sky dialed in. And so I just expanded on it. So ultimately what we're doing is we're going to separate into three entities, water features and waterfall construction okay. and maintenance, and then high-end residential landscape. So patios, pergolas, fire pits, all that kind of stuff. And then start manufacturing faux rocks. So we can make all kinds of different cool rock yeah. formations and waterfalls and all kinds of cool stuff. So that's where we're headed. I'm excited to to dive into those three, but specifically the faux rock. We had a, an event back in June. You and I were there. We were in a little pod talking about different business topics. And you and another one of our <clears throat> mastermind members, John, were talking about this very same thing. And I remember there being some light bulbs going off for the two of you of what it might take to manufacture these things and and how useful they could be across the country, even not just in your area, but for all different types of events and setups and uh, reasons. And so we'll get into some of that here in a bit, but that's really exciting stuff, especially since it, I got to see the inner workings of like how it expanded out a little bit from the outside being uh, inside the group. So before we jump into any of that, I want to know your why. Like I know your why, but I want you to tell the people your why. Why are you doing this? Why are you expanding? Why is what you have not enough? All of that. So that's a Great question, Chaz. That's funny. I think that why has really changed over the years, but I think inevitably it was always in me. Like there was, I always remember my mom telling me the story that when I lost in T-ball, I was kicking the seats and super mad on the way home. And yep. so I just, I hate losing, man. It's not in me. And as I've grown, I started building a family and started seeing some of the potential that we had in the business and where we could go. Yeah. And something in me, I just, it's never good enough. I always want more. I do appreciate what I have and where I've came from and what we've done, but I just see so much more potential in these, even the three companies. A lot of people I think would just stick with the one and be fine with it, but yeah. I'm ready to go gangbusters on all three of them. I think there's just some amazing opportunities. So to answer your question lightly, I think it's always been in there. Now I have a beautiful family, three kids. They're a huge reason that I get out of bed and do what I do in the morning and worked so hard over 10 years to build the businesses. Yeah. So they're a big reason, but something inside me, man, just says you can do more. Yeah. I think every entrepreneur relates to that a little bit, whether they've reached down deep and like actually scratched that maybe like you or I have, that's for them to decide. But 
what I've always appreciated about you is there's a lot of people, and I think even me for a long time, who said family was important. And I think deep down it was, it just didn't, it just wasn't reflected, right? Like I was doing things calendar wise that I thought would reflect back as benefit to my family. And it has, but the one thing I've appreciated about you is that it's not just verbal, that the actions that you take day in and day out are around your family, man. And so was that from the beginning? Did you go through a little period like me where you had to say, oh, geez, like if this is actually important to me, I kind of kind of switch things around and start doing the thing that I'm talking about. What was your experience there? I can actually relate on that 100% because ultimately anybody who has kids know it completely changes your life. It's just a, there's an unconditional love that comes with kids and stuff that's really special. When I started having kids, it was right when I started my company. And so I've been in business for 10 years now. My oldest one is eight and a half. So I was right in the thick of things, man. And I think it was really easy yeah. to put my blinders on and just go a hundred miles per hour as fast as yeah. I could and try to get, trying to provide for the family at the time. Yeah. But then it just turned in and manifested to so much more. I realized what I'd missed out on. I always have taken Sundays, no matter what I've worked 120 hour weeks when I started my business. But one thing I will not sacrifice is my Sundays. I spend my Sundays with my family, but over time, I just realized like, I'm not going to get that time back. And everybody tells you it's only one time and it goes by so quick and whatever, but it really does, man. And I think it hit me probably about four years ago before my third child and really coming to grasp with like my winners are pretty slow. So depending on when my kids were born, I got to spend like either a lot of time with them in the winter interesting, or interesting. it was like I missed out on the summer and then they were at a different stage in their life. So I was able to see like these different stages that like maybe I missed out on with the first one. Yeah. And then by the time the third one came in, I was just like, no, I ain't missing this no more. And we talked even with some of the first sessions we had, the one-on-ones that we had was like, how can we manifest this into actually doing it? As much as spending time was with my kids on Sundays, half the time I was still working. I had my phone, I was answering emails, taking phone calls, whatever. Just I realized that even though I was there, I may not have been actually there in the moment. And yeah. I think, yeah, about four years ago, man, it just hit me where I was like, no, this is a special time. And then we started doing like daddy daughter days where I take just one of the kids. We go do like top golf and bowling and just let them do whatever they want go crazy for a day. And yeah, pretty special, man. I remember the first time I did that with my oldest and she on the way home was like already thinking about the next time. And in that moment, I just realized like how special that was to her, but then also how special it was to me. I got the yeah. chills just telling you here, but it was a special moment, man, in my life where I just kind of realized that they're super important, man. This is the reason we reason we're here and the hundred percent. It's easy though. When you're going, you just go because you have to. And I've gotten to this point in my career where it's like, I need to take the time and spend the time where it's important rather than just put my blinders on. And it was a special time for my life too, when that happened. Yeah. I think the underlying story that you're telling is that the entrepreneur right now who's listening, they're not at seven figures yet. They're wearing a bunch of hats. They're overwhelmed. They're stressed. They're just like, are we going to make it through the winter in your example or whatever? And the blinders feel easy. It is what's easy, right? Like there, there are seasons, there are times blinders are effective and they need to be right. We have to be able to know how to dial in for the better of our family, for the better of our situation, the business, whatever. Generally speaking though, you can do both. You can be obsessed with your family and the business. I think that the permission that most entrepreneurs need of what you're saying is once you just have that like realization moment, I can think of several of these that I've had where it's like, okay, I love. You put the blinders on because you you like it. You're obsessed with it. I get a different dopamine hit, if you will, from building a business than I do from coloring with my children who are eight, six, and three. And it's it's just a different level of, ooh, I really enjoyed this. It doesn't mean that I don't enjoy them. It just means that I get a different level of engagement with this. So I just had to switch my mind and go, okay, what am I doing here? So for me, it was like, okay, I'm building my children. Oh my good, what? I'm building them. How they will be with the wealth that I'm creating is literally predicated on these minutes right now. Yeah. And so I think it's just mindset and it's permission. I can be obsessed with both, which you gave us a, a huge depiction of. I was going to ask you in that, and this is a little bit more practical and we'll get into some business stuff here, but it's the clients 
that maybe call Saturday or call Sunday or the clients that have an issue with you not being available all the time are really the probably the ones that aren't the best fit anyway. Like bigger picture, you want a client, whether it's a, a large water feature or across the country faux rock for a wedding venue thing that's being built, or it's just a landscape design pergola. You want that client to value family like you do. Absolutely. And that's something that kind of over time, at first you just do what you got to do. And after I realized how important it was to me, I make sure to reiterate that to my customers and go, Hey, listen, my family's number one. I'm going to do whatever I can to make you the best backyard or waterfall or whatever. But ultimately if my daughter calls me and she needs me, I'm going. And once I got to that point where it was like, you know, at the beginning, you think you need every job right? You're just hungry. You're trying to get everything you possibly can. You don't have a bunch of leads. Once things kind of start moving in and rolling in and you realize you start getting the rhythm, I really started making sure that everybody knew I was on that same page. And once that happened, that respect came from the customers immediately. Oh yeah, totally. I totally get that. Hey, I'm going to my daughter's day party at school today, so I'm not going to be available. Oh yeah, no problem. A lot of times you just don't even think about telling your customers that because you feel like they don't care or they don't want to know. But I think just having that open communication and going, hey, this is what's important to me. Yeah. Like you said, it's not only just a a mutual respect, it's a whole nother level of respect that they look at you as a business owner, a very successful business owner. Now with multiple companies doing different tasks, it's like, man, for that guy to, to say that And then to spit, actually then to do it. I find that it actually connects me with the right type of client. And I assume that you probably feel the same way. And as you expand, you'll continue to filter that way. Let's get into your story a little bit. You said you've been in business 10 years. You've been, you were grinding for a while. You were this, that, and the other. But before you even started, I want to know, was there a journey before this? How did this business come about? How did you meet your mentor? Give us a little bit of the backdrop. Yeah, I was really heavy in sports in school. I loved sports. I wanted to go to college to play college baseball, hence the Rockies picture behind me. Yeah, That was my ultimate passion. I played baseball for 22 years, but I think it's just having that winning mentality. I played a lot of different sports. I never liked to lose. I always and have always given 120%. I've had people from the other teams come up to me after the game and just go, hey man, we can just tell you're all in and we love it. And I've just never been any other way. And I grew up on a farm. I grew up on a farm and ranch in Eastern Colorado. And started working at a really young age, trying to, we did alfalfa and cattle and all kinds of stuff. So coming from there, I worked outside a lot. I enjoyed being outside. Honestly, I I even took some horticulture classes in FFA, which is Future Farmers of America. Yeah. And I wasn't super intrigued at the time. Okay. And then after I went to college and realized baseball wasn't going to be the end all life plan. It was not the play. (laughs) Yeah, I reverted and I said, you know, what interests me? And I was like, I love being outside. I've always been one with nature, man. I love trees. I love water. And I honestly, I can't even tell you like what that moment was where I just, I decided I wanted to go to horticulture school. Yeah. And so I went to horticulture um, for, for two years and got a design certificate to design. And then I had a job before I even left college. So my plan was that I would if I couldn't get a job from my two-year degree, I would just go to CSU, which is one of the, they have a really great horticultural program and architectural program there in Fort Collins. And I thought, I'll just go there if I can't. But I had a job before I even finished school for a local landscape company out of Brighton. And I worked uh, project manager and design for him for a couple of years. And then just decided, I think I can do this on my own. Yeah, And looking back, it's funny because you really have no clue. And it's easy to judge the people you're working for and stuff. But until it's yours, it's much different. Yeah. From there, from starting my own, I actually about three years in, and this is a long story, so I'll try to keep it short here, but it was meant to be. I met my mentor from Craigslist. My parents, what? yes, my parents, I need to write this in a book. <laughs> my parents were looking for a talent hander, which is like the extendable boom tractor that we load alfalfa with. We always had them. Rick had one, which is my mentor. I was three years into my business, my landscaping business. And my mom came home and she called me and she's all excited. And she goes, Landon, you've got to meet this guy. We went to look at this tractor that we're going to buy. And the guy's been building waterfalls for 50 years all over the world. And just like on and on, loved the guy. 
And she's like, so when we go pick up the machine, you got to come meet them. And uh, it's a really funny story because Rick is a pretty tough dude. Like he's not your normal, he's super creative person, but he is straight to the point business, like yep. old school, old school. Yeah. And I remember because at the time I had just, uh, me and my, we weren't married yet. Me and my wife, Megan weren't married, but she came with me to this property that I now own. I bought the property from him now, but wow. yeah. we drove in and he like is in his skister because he can't hardly walk now. He's crippled up. He's been working his whole life drives up to us and is basically, who the heck are you and what are you doing on my property? And we worked it out to where he did some trading actually with my mother and said, hey, if he'll help me build this waterfall, we'll do a little trading with some alfalfa because he owns horses. And the rest is history, man. He helped me wow. for about five years. I would sell the jobs because he was retired. Yeah. And uh, so I would sell the jobs to my customers and then he would come in and help me build them and teach me and explain what to look for and how to set the rocks and all the cool things. And it really a game changer in my life, dude. Like I said, it was meant to be one way or another because he's just, he's a genius when it comes to, he built waterfalls in the zoos all over the world, Puerto Rico, Aruba, wow. uh, the Denver Zoo, San Diego Zoo. And you're just not going to get that knowledge and experience anywhere else. And so it was a life altering person that I met. I got really lucky and I was able yeah. to work really hard because I grew up on the farm. So I knew how to work and I had enough, I had enough gumption that I didn't want to lose. Yeah. And he yeah. was super hard on me. It took a long time for him to give me that acceptance of uh, me building them on my own and him approving them and liking them without yeah. critiquing everything that I did. Uh huh. But it was super special, man, because he taught me a lot. He taught me a lot of the ins and outs of the business and large scale stuff. If you look at our work, we built a lot of very big, just in your face water features they're big huge boulders only setting with heavy equipment and it sets us apart from other people but i got that from rick and it was pretty special to meet him and even tell you about the journey because it's funny i almost forget now it's been seven years i've been building them on my own now he helped me for about yeah. three so yeah you got to remember those moments it sounds like you got a design certificate in horticulture but you got a degree in rick i did 100 <laughs> percent, man and and like i said it was not it was no easy road. I think a lot of kids would have been yeah. like, eh, I don't think so. Dirt, I'm out. <laughs> but I think from where I grew up and the work ethic that I learned growing up on the farm, I wasn't afraid to work, man. I was not afraid to get in there and get dirty and make it happen. And once we built that one, I think he knew immediately like what the opportunity was. We, we built probably 30 in those three years. And then I've built probably a hundred cents. Yeah. I think what you just said tops the story off. I want to point it out to the listener. Rick knew from the beginning, whether he said it or not, he's obviously was super hard on you throughout the time. He didn't definitely didn't give you approval right away. But the reality of it is that he probably knew because you were hungry, you were coachable, all these things that you probably learned from baseball, you probably learned from the farm, that your backdrop, but I want the listener to pick this up because if you look back at your history, and what got you to seven figures, water features is a huge part of that. And so if you hadn't have met Rick, if you hadn't, have, even if you had met Rick, but you were arrogant and thought you had it all together and you weren't coachable and you weren't hungry and you didn't want to learn the new thing. And you just thought he was just an old, dirty, just tied up and just, I don't want to, I don't want to, I don't want to mess with it. He's just old and frumpy is what I'm trying to say, but you didn't, you personally persevered through maybe the beating, if you will. And it worked out. And so I guess I'm encouraging the listener and I'll give you a chance here to chime in here, but I'm encouraging the listener to not only make themselves coachable. They're obviously looking for answers. They're listening right here, right now. But it's like, what have you done at the level of this, where you go and you meet someone or you join a group or you meet someone in your industry or at a conference or wherever, and you, then you take it to the next level. You press in, you go, okay, how can I actually grow myself by getting to know this person or this networking group or this you know individual who's an expert in my field, whatever it is, that's part of the growth of the next level to get to some figures is like pressing into that individual person, whether they're an, a mentor or not, it's the level of you being coachable and changing yourself. Would you like to add anything to that, Landon? Yeah, man. Cause really there's only two times in my life that I actually experienced this life changing moment. And it was like, after I was doing seven figures and I just felt like I wasn't going anywhere else. Like I was just in a kind of a rut, which is yeah, yeah. why I joined these groups. And I'm in this group, which has been fantastic. And another one, 
for sales training and stuff. And ultimately you got to want it enough. And I think I had an ego. I ain't afraid to say it. I had plenty of an ego. I thought I learned from the best guy in the world and I was the best. I think it just took that moment of realization of, Hey, you can always be better. You can always do better. You can be more efficient. You can you know, make the customer experience better. There's just so many different aspects of what we do. That's yeah. not just, and I reiterated this to my guys this morning. There's just, it's a 360 degree view. You got to look at all those aspects and you got to want it. But that one in the middle of my life, I was like, I don't need anybody else to help me. I don't need you. You need me. And once I flipped that mindset, with Rick won because I had to really taking a beating is saying it, it was tough. <laughs> He's screaming at me. That's just how he learned. I love him for it. But it was that other moment. Like when I joined these groups where I realized like there's so much power in you actually understanding and, and taking a step back and going, Hey, set your ego aside a little bit. You know, we can always get better. And as long as you have that mindset, it changes everything. It truly does. I was at the point in my career where I was like, I'm done. Like, this is it. This is as far as I can go. I've just pushed myself to the max. There's no way in heck that I could go any further on my own. And then I had to take another step back and join these groups and learn from other people and other experiences and go, it is possible. It's changing your mindset again. So from going from a doer and doing all this work and the guy said, I can't do it. I just step in and do it for him right. to being a teacher which is what I've really become over the last year and a half, two years, trying to get it from seven figures to eight going, Hey, this is the only way to go there. And why try to do it on your own and fight yourself and not take other people's experiences to heart and try to learn and grow. And I think it's super important, man, but there's a point in your life where you just have to realize doing it alone is not, it's not going to get you where you want to go. Yeah. And it sucks. It's not fun. It's lonely. It's real. Yeah, lonely. Like with someone or by myself. Now, granted, I am an introvert. I do like my time in the tree stand. I get that. But man, why would you want to go to a party by yourself? Nope. It, there's a time and a place. Okay. So let's get practical here. Let's go early on first, like two, three, four years in your business. I want to know of a good decision that you made that you can look back on and go, boom, if I would, if I had a chance, I'd do it over and over again. What was it? That's another good question. I think ultimately that's gotta be the time where I decided to go out on my own. And I just realized you got to take that step. Got to take that step. A lot of people, I think, look at it and go, man, should I really do this? They way overthink it. They overanalyze some of the things. And sometimes, yeah, you want to be thoughtful about your decisions and stuff, but I think taking those leaps of faith to try to get to that next level and joining a group like this and right. doing those little things is, is key. And if I wouldn't have done those, there's no way I would be where I'm at today. There's just, it's not, it's not possible. So initially it was starting the business. Eventually, like you're saying that same mindset of making a decision, even when it feels a little scary, taking a chance, taking a leap, which is like starting a business, right? That mindset really probably in multiple decisions has served you well. I'm, I'm sure it's you know, bit you a couple of times. I think it has for all of us. You take enough risks, one of them's not, not going to work out. But I, what I'm hearing you say the underlying is for the listener is like, when you get a little uncomfortable, it's probably actually a good thing. 100% makes you grow, makes you learn, makes you a little bit vulnerable, makes you a little hungrier. It gives you a reason. And my grandpa always said, I'd call him and I'd go, grandpa or pappy, I would need this machine. What do you think? And he'd go, you going to use it? And I'm like, yep. He goes, it gives you a reason to get out of bed. And I think everybody needs that reason. And unless you take a few risks here and there, um, there's been multiple, I, not one really stands out to me, Tess. I didn't answer your question real great there, but good. there's been multiple times where I've just been at that point going, man, should I do this? Should I not? And if you don't take some of those risks, you're not going to progress. You're not going to push yourself. You got to keep, you got to have that progression. You got to keep pushing the limits and figure out where you can go. Yeah. You bring up the wisdom from your pappy. My grandpa on the wolf side, who I didn't meet until 11 years ago, the backdrop story of me not knowing my dad, but the listener may not, didn't know my grandfather until obviously I met my dad. And I was in a conversation with him, I don't know, maybe six, seven years ago. And he's in his eighties now, but really didn't start his farming career until he was into his fifties. The kids were graduated, my dad and my uncle and my aunt, they were already out of the house. And basically at that point, he felt like, now I feel like I can take the risk because before he wasn't willing to take the risk because kids and wife and just came from a very humble, I would even say poor upbringing. And he just wasn't willing to take the risk. But when he did, he's been uber successful in farming since. 
and we were talking about some land and a couple of business decisions and it was just, we were just catching up. And what he was given to me was the same thing that your pappy just told you, which is like, if I, knowing what I know now, I just would have done it sooner. The risk that the chance that I was taking that I thought was too great early, it wasn't, I would have been just fine. He's like, you want to buy a piece of property? You want to buy a business? Go do it. Go do it. Because when I look back, I wish I would have done it more. Well, my grandpa was very similar, man. He started from nothing. He, his family didn't own property or anything. He started a propane business and then decided he wanted to farm and he's grown an incredible amount of property and land and set up some of his kids. And it's been really special to watch. And he's been my, he's my inspiration for sure. Yeah. I love it. We got to have that picture of what that looks like for us because otherwise who are we emulating? A guru of some kind. All right, let's flip the, let's flip the coin. What was the bad choice that you made that uh, didn't turn out so well, but I'm sure you learned a bunch. (laughs) This one's actually super easy. This one's real easy. About four years in when I got into the business and I was really seeing a lot of growth and was going crazy. And I thought I was making a bunch of money and I really scaled really fast. I went from three guys to 15 guys with over a year and a half span. Yeah. Bought a couple trucks, like just went all in. You were over here beating on your chest a little bit. (laughs) Oh, I was, that was back when I had that big ego too. So that, that didn't help at all, but it really bit me in the butt. I had to after about a year and a half of doing it, two years, looked back at the year and went like, where'd the money go? What happens? I thought we were doing all this work. I thought we were making a bunch of money. We scaled quickly in our gross. But at the time, that was all I was really concerned with was like, how much work are we doing when I should have been looking at the bottom line of our net and what we were actually making. And I had to really take a step back. I got, I went back down to about five guys or six guys maybe from the 15 and it worked out. There were some guys from the oil rigs that lost their jobs and then had to go back. So it worked out for me where I got rid of a handful of guys, really started dialing in our margins and being more thoughtful about my growth after learning my lesson there going, I don't want to do that again. I worked really hard that year and didn't have a lot to show for it. So that one was an easy one. That, That one hurt. Yeah. Their growth is expensive. So anytime you want to grow, it's going to cost. But what you're what you're giving to the listener right now is pretty spot on. I think that every entrepreneur, including myself, can look back at that moment and go, I don't even know how to explain. I can look at the paper. I can look at the sales. I can look at the teams, the businesses for me across the country. Where did it all go? And uh, you're right. It's that's that. outside the moment. Yeah. And so from out of that, you're talking about dialing in process, dialing in margin, dialing in probably your pricing, your sales process a little bit the execution and efficiency on the back end. anything you want to add there as far as what kind of came out of that? Basically everything you just said, just really dialing in, making sure my numbers were good when I was bidding and estimating and selling the projects all the way to project management and making sure the guys were being efficient, making sure they had the right equipment to be efficient, setting them up for success. There's a lot of that when you're growing that gets pushed to the side because you're just too busy with other things. And so I would just say for anybody listening, just take that time Think it through, take those leaps of faith, but also dial in everything that you're doing. Because as you grow, so does your your overhead. And that was the thing that I overlooked was that, yeah, we were doing a bunch of work, but our overhead was also growing and I wasn't finding the middle ground and making sure we were making our margins. So it's a lot of different stuff. It was a multitude of everything that we did. I had to really dial in and get more precise with. Yeah, hundred percent. I think that's, it's super solid advice, but the listener, they probably, if they've heard multiple shows, they've heard me talk about the four sections of their business the marketing sales, client experience, and then finance. And this finance piece eludes people because it just, it's kind of difficult. Uh, the, there's moving numbers. Like I, like even today, you and I both, we could sit down with our PLs and there it, there's gray in areas. And you're like, I don't know, fully understand how that got to be that number. And it's hard to track back and where did it come from? And so I think that what that does is it makes us big unknown. And so then people go, yeah, I'll just stay away from it, which is like, God, ah, like the worst thing that you could do. So I think you've given them plenty to think about and practically inside the business, thinking efficiencies and sales process and pricing, whether you're dialing into the numbers or not, if you can get those things right, the numbers will probably work out. Eventually you got to meet, you got to meet your maker and that's the finance. That's the P and L that's your, that's your balance sheet. It can be overwhelming because you look at it yeah. and you're like, Wait a second. And it's just, it never ends. That's something that you need to realize as you're growing a business that that overhead is, is constantly changing, whether it's up, down, whatever. 
you're paying off stuff, you're getting new stuff. That's it's just a never ending thing. So don't ever think that it's going to just stay where it's at. It's a constant change. I think that's part of owning a business. That's a little bit tough to swallow at first. Yeah. It's never going to, it's never going to stay here. If you're trying to grow, it's never going to stay. So yeah, it makes me think of something I've never really put two and two together on. I've always been a huge fan of getting around, whether it be people or certain parts of the world that where money is just obviously abundant. Money neither here nor there. It's just a tool. I don't necessarily fancy expensive things, although we all do to a degree. But for me, when I can think about either people that I've gotten around or places in the country where, geez, there is so much money here. And you start calculating in your brain, as an entrepreneur, if you don't intentionally do that, or even just a, a simple vision board, like a board on your wall, and you got a car that you want, and you got the number, or whatever is your thing. I don't have a car on mine, but it's a piece of property, or it's a something for your family. I don't know. But knowing the number makes you then realize on the back end, like we were saying, when, the, when those expenses are growing, it doesn't, you don't fumble on that. Like you can see the sales growing, and it's okay that your expenses are growing because you're thinking of something so much bigger that you're after. It's just not a big deal. We know that this is where we're going because otherwise we get stuck in, on one more zero, two more zeros, three more zeros. It's like a lot until it's not. It doesn't really matter. It's the bottom line, man. That's a, And my mentor told me that a lot and it changed my perspective as I started growing because I realized like he wasn't just full of crap. It's what you put in your pocket that really matters. And it doesn't matter if you're doing a hundred million dollars, if you're only making... 1% on hundred million. It's a lot of work for nothing, man. Yeah. Well, let's fast forward. Let's talk about 2023. You mentioned briefly at the beginning, you've had these three sections of a business and you've really grown it to actual real thriving businesses. 2023 is around the corner. What does it look like for you? It's exciting, Chaz. It's super exciting because I uh, they've all been one and they've all been culminating on their own, like the faux rock I've done for a lot of home and garden shows and been doing landscaping from the very beginning and the waterfalls came in when Rick came. And so they've all kind of just gradually worked together in their self. But now I want to really separate them and go like, hey, I think we could be doing 1.5 million just in the landscape business in high-end construction as we're doing these $150,000, $200,000 projects pretty regularly, it's not out of reach. And I realized that in my mind and went, okay, I think I could actually do this with all three of them, have all three of them be a, a seven-figure business pretty easily just by putting the people in the right place. So I mentioned the Home and Garden Show. We're actually feature gardener at the Denver Home and Garden Show, which is pretty big. And actually Incredible. this year, we are the entry garden. So we're literally the first one that comes in. We build this incredible display with waterfalls and pavers and blocks and just build a $300,000 backyard inside the Colorado Convention Center with equipment, with boulders and everything. Wow. And that has allowed me to learn the capabilities of Faux Rock. Like I said, they've all worked together in itself and they've all kind of grown to this point. But now I think it's time to take them to the next level. And like you said, we've had calls, we've rented them for commercials. We're going to be building a massive wedding venue that we've talked about setting up temporary displays for weddings. There's just so many opportunities and capabilities of the faux rock that it could totally be its own entity. And so now I'm just working through all the marketing, all the websites, logos, branding, all that stuff to really decipher them all on their own. And it's a completely different way of thinking that I have been. But I'm yeah. super excited for what the future holds because I think it's the sky's the limit. It's just going to be a matter of how much I can push and how quickly we can do it. Not too quickly. Yeah, no, you're 100% right. It's All in the strategy. I'll give the listeners a chance on how they can connect with you in a little bit. But the faux rock, you're building boulders. Like they look real size of me and you're, you built actual water features with these already. It's, this is not an idea. This is not a concept. You've done this already. This is just now you taking it to a mass scale. I know that wedding venue is in another state. Didn't you rented them recently for a TV shoot ad, ad or something that was set up? So you built like this rock feature for this TV ad or something, right? Yeah. Yeah. So some, uh, some media production company called me and wanted to use them for a commercial. So we took them down there, set them up for them and then let them rent them for two days and then went and picked them back up. Yeah. And I honestly, I didn't even think that was a possibility. And so as I've grown and things are thing I've realized even knowing the opportunity there was now, I just think there's just so much that can be done with it yeah. and so many different avenues and places we can utilize them and indoors, 100%. restaurants, hotels, all kinds of places. So it's exciting. 
Yeah, hundred percent. Don't let my wife know. She might want a water feature in the house. That uh, <laughs> I know a guy. A, yeah, you know a guy. Yeah, exactly. This has been incredible. I want to go to the speed round here. We've talked a lot about education over the course of just me and you getting to know each other inside of the group. But what book or maybe source of education would you recommend to a listener, six figure business owner? They're wanting to scale like you did. What would you? What book would you recommend? That's another good question. I'm super motivational. So just recently, probably about a month ago, read Can't Hurt Me by David Goggins. Um, but another one that that was just super inspirational. But I think Extreme Ownership was incredible. And it put it in a different perspective because realistically, at the end of the day, you got to take ownership for everything that you do. And I explained to my guys like, hey, you're on the job. But at the end of the day, the homeowner calls me. And so I think just knowing that you're going to have to take responsibility and change my whole outlook on life and business and everything. Yeah. And in order to scale, because really what scaling quote unquote means is that you're helping more clients. You have more people on your team. You have to have a better experience, a better sales process, better finances, like all of this stuff matters. And you can't do that if you don't have ownership. If you're not, if you're not the one saying, okay, if it's up to anybody, if it's up to me, it'll be that, that level of thinking is required. What would you say, obviously, this is a little bit of a play on words here since you're already a part of our mastermind group, but what do you think about intentionally networking and or a masterminding, maybe even your thoughts around gathering the Kings specifically? Yeah, man, I can straight up tell you, I would have never thought about paying for some sort of being in a group or getting coaching because when I was younger, like I said, I had a pretty good ego. I didn't think there was a lot to learn and whatever. Yeah. And I'm okay with that. I hit that point in my life where I realized in order to grow, I had to surround myself with other people who either had been there, could support me along the way, maybe have advice. So I can't say enough. You're on here. We're in Gathering of the Kings, but the relationships that we've already made within Gathering of the Kings is incredible. And I'm going to be traveling halfway across the country to build a crazy water feature at a wedding venue from it already. Surrounding yourself with the types of people that are think the same as you. I mentioned earlier, it gets pretty dang lonely growing a company. Uh, we don't think like everybody else thinks. And it's easy to hide in the corner and go, just keep going. And allowing yourself to be around other people that think like you, that are willing to support you. You can't put a dollar amount on it. It's just not possible. It's incredible the relationships that we've made in the groups and what we've learned and the advice and from other people's experiences. There's just, like I said, there's not a number you can put on it. So like you just said, like obviously jobs that you've won, fine. Like that's an easy measurable, right? Like quantifiable money you paid, money you're going to, I mean, easy, 10X. But the, all the other things that matter more, but it's so difficult as a six-figure business owner or even an early seven-figure business owner to really go, do I pay for something like this? Do I, like, it, it's a difficult pill to swallow. I remember swallowing it myself, going to a conference for 2,500 bucks. I was like, I have never paid this type of money to, for this for a two day deal. I was just like, this is crazy. <clears throat> now I'm like, oh, it's only 2,500. Who's, who's going to be there? Okay, great. What am I going to, okay. Great, boom, boom. Oh, that's it. Oh, psh. because of the power of what you just said, not only just the relationships, but all the things that are unmeasurable. Yeah. Well, relationships are key in business in life and everything. But a lot of times those relationships that you really need as close as you would hope they would be they're not as easily attainable. Like the relationships you build in your business just happens naturally. Whereas building a relationship with somebody you don't know halfway across the country that thinks like you, wants to help push you, help you grow, help you learn. It's really special, man. And with the opportunity we have with social media and all these ways, like we're Zoom calling now across the States. It's really incredible, the connection. And I was even skeptical at the beginning with us being halfway across the country with other people going like, how much can we really connect? But because we all really think alike, it was so quick that it just, it blew my mind. And then when we get together, we're going to meet up in Kansas City. I am stoked, man. Like I, I'm so excited to see everybody get together, go have fun, learn and grow, right? That's the... That's what it's about. So it's very yeah. special. And it's, I would highly encourage anybody who's on the fence, just do it. My wife looked at me like I was nuts when I told her, I love but that. it's another one of those making those decisions. You put yourself out there on a limb yeah. and got to get you know, better. You know, it's funny too. You didn't tell me that at the beginning about, about Megan, but what I do know about Megan is obviously I've met her and we've chatted a couple of times since, but <clears throat> the feedback that she's 
told me since of, oh my gosh, he's a different, he's a different guy. Thank you for providing a, an opportunity for this guy to be crazy with other crazies. It actually helps us yeah. is generally the feedback. And it's like, man, for even a wife to have that type of transformation through you having the transformation that you've had, that's pretty, pretty powerful when you really think about it. Yep. Landon, it we're coming close here to the end. I got one last question for you. If you could whisper in the younger Landon's ear, <laughs> what would you say? Oh man, I got to go back to the ego thing, man. Set your ego aside realize that there's always room for improvement. There's always somebody who's been there, done it. Don't get, don't let your ego get in front of you and hold you back. Yeah. Get a little vulnerable, put yourself out there, meet new people. You have nothing to lose. What's the worst case scenario? hundred percent. Love that. You've been sensational. I don't say that obviously because you're my buddy at this point, but dude, if the listener was listening today, I know that they, they can't stay the same. They're either going to choose to stay the same or they listen to you and they're going to grow. How can the listener connect with you? They, they want to connect with you as an entrepreneur. They want to they wanna test you to actually make sure that you're an actual member of Gathering the Kings and make sure <laughs> this is real. Maybe they need, they have an event coming up or they're part of a business where they need faux rock and they need to rent and or buy your product. How can they find you? So we are all over social media. You can find us at LCM Landscape, landscape.com. We're in the middle of refining all that right now, but if you just search our company name, you're going to see all the water feature stuff and all that. We're on TikTok, Instagram, Den, Facebook, we're everywhere, YouTube. So if you just search our company, LCM Landscape and Design, you'll find us. Dude, I obviously appreciate you and your willingness to serve and give, but dude, you, you gave more than the listener bargained for today here. And so thank you for that. Of course, I wish you nothing but blessing on your family and your businesses. And uh, man, 2023 is going to be big for you. The three categories that you're pressing into, can't wait to see what you do with it. Thanks for being here. I appreciate it, man. I think, thank you for having me. It was a pleasure. Thanks for listening to Gathering the Kings. We hope you got a ton of value today and learned a thing or two about taking your business to seven figures and beyond. If you desire more and want a community around you to help you get there, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com. That's gatheringthekings.com. And I want you to apply for our next Becoming a King 90-Day Intensive. We are extremely exclusive by nature as a group. What that means is that we're really wanting only the entrepreneurs who take their business and targets super serious to apply. So if that's you, you think you got what it takes to level up your business, I want you to go to gatheringthekings.com and apply. And we will see you on the other side.